doesn't oh, matter where yeah. you point. All right, second talk by, will be by Greg Moore from Rockers. He will talk about update on SUSE field theory and the invariance of smooth four manifolds. Well, there's been progress. Thing, well, things are moving in the subject of uh, supersymmetric field theory and invariance of four manifolds. I think they're moving forward. Uh, and so I'd like to tell you a little bit about that today. And thank you to the organizers for the uh, opportunity to do so. So let's begin with some motivation. Let's recall the uh, glorious history of the relationship between four-dimensional field theory and four-manifold topology. Uh, in some sense, it began with the discovery of instantons in 1975, which led rather directly to the invention discovery of Donaldson invariance, which also led rather directly to topological quantum field theory. And that was at least part of the motivation for the renowned work of Zyberg and Witten, which uh, led to a revolution both in string theory and in differential topology of four manifolds in 1995. Now, it's obvious to you that not all questions in string theory are answered. Maybe less obvious is that not all questions in four manifold differential topology have been answered. One way to make that point is the following. Let's let X be a four-dimensional, smooth, compact, oriented manifold without boundary. For simplicity, we'll take it to be connected and simply connected. And an essential assumption in Donaldson and zyberg witten theory, they're really the same, is that X admits an almost complex structure. Well, under these conditions, that means that B2 plus of X is odd. There's no reason in the world for a four manifold to have B2 plus odd. For example, the four sphere has B2 equals zero. So in some sense, we're missing half the world of four manifolds. Now, we'll relax that condition at the end of the talk, and whether that's significant or not, I do not know. But um, it just is one of many indications that there's a lot left to learn. So as a physicist, that motivates me to look at various generalizations of the Donaldson-Witten paradigm. We could look at other four-dimensional theories. We could look at five-dimensional theories, six-dimensional theories. We could couple the background supergravity. And these might lead to truly new invariants that are independent of the Donaldson and Zyberg-Witten invariants. Uh, or they might not. By truly independent, I mean distinguish two homeomorphic but not diffeomorphic four manifolds, uh, which can't be distinguished by zyberg witten invariants. That's a tall order, and it would be unwise to use that as a measure of success. So in today's talk, some of, well, I'll show you that some of these generalizations lead to interesting issues in quantum field theory, analytic number theory, and topology. So I think it's still worth thinking about. All right, so now I begin by talking a little bit about topologically twisted four-dimensional n equals two theories. As I'll explain a little more, it's based on just a group homomorphism. So in that language, Witten's original example is based on a homomorphism of SO4 to be thought of as the structure group of the tangent bundle of a four-manifold into spin four times SU2 SU2 for our symmetry divided by the Z2 subgroup, which is a distinguished Z2 subgroup. It's the one that acts trivially on the vector multiplet representations. It's a small calculation. And then when you make the twisted super Yang Mills theory based on this homomorphism, you get a function for, on the homology of the four manifold, which only depends on the oriented diffeomorphism type and a choice of a tough flux. But for other four-dimensional n equals two theories, one must choose other tangential structures, tangential, tangential structures in the sense that uh, Arun used at the beginning of this week. Uh, you, you must choose other tangential structures to define the twisted theory. So for example, for n equals two star, one must choose a spin C structure. 
And then the twisted partition function, it's a function on the homology of your four manifold, only depends on the oriented diffeomorphism type of X, a choice of a tough flux, and a spin C structure, an ultraviolet spin C structure. So it's a natural question. What is the general tangential structure that you need for twisted four-dimensional n equals two theories? And work in progress with Vivek Saxena, who's a postdoc at Rutgers and needs a job, and Ranveer Singh, who's a graduate student at Rutgers, we're investigating that question. So the natural first thing to do is to look at Lagrangian four-dimensional n equals two theories, and there we have an answer I'll show you. And our goal is to answer it further for a general arbitrary class S and maybe general four-dimensional n equals two theories. So first with the Lagrangian case, what's the basic data you need to define a renormalizable Lagrangian D equals four n equals two theory? Well, we're gonna have a gauge group and that gauge group is going to have a simple, simply connected cover. So that'll be G tilde, some semi-simple compact Lie group. And then we're going to choose a quaternionic representation of G tilde. And uh, with a suitable metric, the commutant of the gauge operators gives you the flavor symmetry group. And so now we form this group, a product of four factors, G tilde, spin four, SU2R symmetry, and the flavor group. So, so we've got this group, and now to define a physical theory, we, meet, we need to make a choice of a finite abelian group, C physical, in the center of G tilde cover. And it should act trivially on our hypermultiplet representations. And then the fields of the physical theory are based on a bundle, P physical with connection, for a structure group, which is this quotient. So then, we can say, what is the set of all fields? Or in the sense of Fried and Hopkins, we should actually speak of a sheaf of all fields, a sheaf on men. Well, we have the bundle with connection. We'll have a flat gerb. It's, if you like uh, this, this terminology, it's a one form background, uh, background gauge field for the one form symmetries. And you'll have masses, couplings, and hypermultiplet fields. I'm going to be focusing on number one here. And it's very useful to use a very simple mathematical idea here called transfer of structure group. If I have a homomorphism of groups, G1 to G2, then I can map a principal G1 bundle, P1 over M, to a principal G2 bundle. Phi, I'll call it phi lower star of P1. And one way to think of it is if you like transition functions and patches, and you have transition functions into G1, you just apply the homomorphism to it, get transition functions into G2. Phi is a homomorphism, so the co-cycle condition is still true. A uh, more sophisticated way to say it is that you can do the associated bundle construction, or if you like, if you have such a phi, then you have B phi from BG1 to BG2. Anyway, you look at it, you have this transfer of structure group. And this phi star extends to the category of bundles with connection. If you have a connection nobla one on P1, you get a connection nobla two, which I'll call phi star nobla one on phi star P1. And all you gotta do is compute the holonomies of the connection nobla one, apply the homomorphism to it, and get the holonomies on nobla for nobla two. You declare those to be the holonomies of nobla two, and that defines the connection nobla two. Okay, so now we have this covering group, and so we have four group homomorphisms, which are projections to the four factors. And using this terminology, what is P1 star? Well, those are our dynamical gauge fields. What is P2 star? Well, that's going to be fixed to be the frame bundle with the connection, a Levi-Chevita connection for some Ramanian metric. P3 star is going to give us the R symmetry bundle and connection, and P4 star the flavor bundle and connection. And when I think about these things, I usually think of these four pieces of data separately, but I want to encourage you to think of them all as being one part of uh, data for P physical and novel physical, because after all, that division by the finite group C is tying them together. 
So that point of view is very useful. For example, it dispels a misconception that I've had for a long time, which is that um, sometimes it's said that you can't define firm, you can't define uh, um, you can't define these these n equals two theories on non-spin manifolds because you have fermions in the theory. But in the twisted theory, we haven't gotten to twisted theories yet, but in the twisted theory you can because the fermions become differential forms. I think that's actually a misconception. What you need is a principal bundle with this structure group. So if the image under P2 times P3 of this uh, finite subgroup contains this magic Z2 subgroup, which acts as one on vector multiplets, then these bundles can very well exist on non-spin manifolds. It has nothing to do with the twisting of the theory. So these, these theories, the physical theories, if you like, can exist on non-spin manifolds. What you need is a principal bundle, uh, pointer, you, what you need is a physical bundle for this G physical, uh, sorry, a well-defined bundle with structure group G physical. Now I won't so, say so much about the role of the gerb, that's there to allow the introduction of a tuft flux that's best done in the slab or sandwich or quiche or sim TFT picture, Sakura was talking about that yesterday. And um, the application of those ideas to this particular uh, to this particular problem is in my paper with uh, Fried and Telemann and doubtless many other places and is well explained in more detail in Dan Fried's write-up of his String Math 2022 talk. In any case, this uh, gerb has a characteristic class which is in H2 with finite uh, group coefficients which are just the projection under P1 of this C physical that we had to choose to define the theory. I think on view of time, I'll skip over an interesting uh, necessary condition on the one form symmetry field. So we've got these uh, physical fields, and the next thing we want to do in the quantum theory is we have to decide what's dynamical and what's, what's background. Well, the first thing to choose are what are the, the background fields. Typically, that will be a subsheaf of the sheaf of all fields. So we'll have a map from the physical fields to the background fields. And in general, the dynamical fields are the fibers of pi. And in general, that vibration is non-trivial. That just means that what you define as your physical fields depends on what the background fields are. Now we have an exponentiated action on the space of all physical fields. And you should think of the partition function as a function of the background fields is some kind of push forward of phi uh, under pi, and that'll be an important point of view at the end of the talk. So now we're ready to start talking about topological twisting. So the idea is to upgrade Witten's homomorphism to a homomorphism I'll call phi twisted from a group G twisted to G physical and define your dynamical and background fields by saying, okay, we have a principal bundle, P twisted for G twisted. We take an arbitrary connection on that, and then because uh, we've chosen an astute homomorphism, if we make this uh, push forward, then our partition function will be invariant under continuous deformations of the background fields for this twisted bundle. And that'll, that'll be true for the usual reasons that there exists a, a, a Q such that Q squared is zero. So here's the picture. This is the usual physical picture. Now we're going to find an, an astute subset of the set of all physical fields defined by this homomorphism such that if we take the path integral, it's independent of continuous deformations of the connections, the background field connections. And so what Vivek and, and Ranvier and I did was we constructed an explicit group. It's just G tilde times spin four times TF and an explicit uh, finite abelian group and homomorphism such that this all holds. And then the twisted partition function will depend on the diffeomorphism type of X, the atuft flux, and what I'll call a generalized spin C structure. So I'm defining it here. It's a principal bundle for this structure group, spin four times TF, a torus, uh, divided by a finite abelian group such that 
If I project on the first factor, I get the frame bundle of x. Now, just like symmetries, generalized symmetries, and there are tuft anomalies, the topological twisting data should be an RG invariant, so it should be possible to extract the uh, fields F twisted from, directly from the low energy effective zyberg witten theory. We haven't done that. We did it by starting with an, a non-abelian ultraviolet defined uh, Lagrangian theory, but it should be possible to extract the same data from the zyberg witten theory. And that would be a good thing to do because it would allow us to find the twisting data for generalized class S theories. But since I'm pretty confident that it can be done, I'll stick my neck out and make a conjecture that uh, for any four-dimensional n equals two theory, Lagrangian or not, class S or not, as long as I have twisted masses, it admits a topological twisting with a uh, twisted partition function, which is only a function of oriented diffeomorphism type. The isomorphism classes of the background gerbs for the one-form symmetries, and what I just defined as generalized spin C structure. Okay, so that's what I had to say about topological twisting. Any questions? Okay. So C is going to be such that I have a homomorphism to SO4. So it's just a principal bundle for this structure group uh, such that, so I have projections P1 to spin 4, such that P1 star is equal to the frame bundle of X. That's a generalization of the usual definition. All right, so I want to review very briefly, since you've all seen it many, many times, the uh, Donaldson-Witten paradigm. So we're going back to Witten's paper from 1988. He has an SU2 vector multiplet. So he has a connection on the gauge bundle in the notation of the first section, that's P1. And he has a Q symmetry, and the image of uh, the gauge field is uh, one form fermion. Those are part of the twisted fermions. Q on the fermions is a gauge transformation by the complex adjoint valued scalar field, phi, which itself is Q invariant. So we'll see these equations again at the end of the talk and an important viewpoint on those equations uh, pointed out by Bellew and Singer, I believe, is that these are the equations that define G equivariant cohomology of the moduli space of gauge connections where curly G is the uh, group of gauge transformations. Now, back to Witten's paper, how do you construct observables? Well, phi is Q invariant. You want to make it gauge invariant, so you take the zero observable as the trace of phi squared. Part of the twisted supersymmetries is an operator K, such that the supersymmetry algebra becomes K with Q as the exterior derivative, which means we can form J form operators by acting with K, J times. We can integrate those J-form operators over closed J cycles, and that defines a Q-invariant operator, which only depends on the homology class of this uh, sigma J. So Witten defines a function on the homology of the four-manifold. ZW of a homology class is just taking the, the correlation functions, the generating function for the cor correlation functions of O of sigma. And one of his main statements is that that is independent of the metric on the four-manifold. And then it was shown that this path integral localizes to an integral over the moduli space, or people tell me it's better to say moduli stack here, the moduli stack of uh, anti-self-dual gauge connections, where F plus, is, that's my definition. And um, OK, so we localize to that. Now, meanwhile, Donaldson had defined a map mu, the famous mu map, from the homology of the four manifold into the cohomology of the instanton moduli space or stack. And so Donaldson defines his function on the homology 
by saying, OK, let's exponentiate mu of sigma and integrate over moduli space. And he shows that even though the moduli space depends on the metric, uh, this function, Z Donaldson, does not. And so another main claim of Witten's paper is that Z Donaldson is Z Witten. So let's call it the Donaldson-Witten function. And it only depends on these two pieces of data, the oriented diffeomorphism type and a choice of a tough flux. So then the question is, how do we evaluate it? Well, since it's independent of metric, we can scale up the metric, which means we can evaluate it using the low energy zyberg witten low energy effective theory. And that turns out to be a sum of two terms. I'll call it the Coulomb branch term and the zyberg witten term. And I said it was metric independent, and I lied. When B2 plus is equal to 1, there is a little bit of metric dependence. When B2 plus is 1, H2 plus is a line inside the cohomology, second cohomology of X. And so these, uh, these terms actually depend on a choice, uh, choice of oriented line in that space, the oriented line being defined by the self-dual forms. Now, an important point from my paper with Witten in 1997 is that one can deduce the zyberg witten contributions from the Coulomb branch contributions. And therefore, it's logical to start with the Coulomb branch contributions. So what is the Coulomb branch uh, contribution? Well, that's an integral over the Coulomb branch of vacua of the theory on R4. So for g equals su2, a single vector multiplet, we have the Coulomb branch parameterized by the expectation value of trace phi squared. And then the measure is computed using the low energy effective theory for a single vector, a U1 vector multiplet. And famously, that low energy effective theory is derived from the zyberg witten geometry of a family of holomorphic or Riemann surfaces, ecliptic curves in this case, equipped with a holomorphically varying uh, uh, one form which is itself is meromorphic on the surface. Okay, now what Zyberg and Witten also showed is that the effective action is very nicely written if you have a modular parameterization of the U-plane. And uh, that modular parameterization in this case turns out to be uh, given by a Haupt module for gamma upper naught 4, this modular function for gamma upper naught 4. So here's an example of a fundamental domain for gamma naught 4. So now the Coulomb branch integral is going to be an integral over that fundamental domain of a, uh, a function h of tau, which is holomorphic and metric independent. And it turns out a total derivative with respect to tau bar of some function g hat. So this g hat comes from the photon path integral. It's not holomorphic in tau. And disturbingly, it's continuously metric, metric dependent. But nevertheless, when you do the integral over the tau fundamental domain, it turns out that it only depends on the metric through this j. Now, this g of tau is a mock Jacobi form. And the theory of mock Jacobi forms uh, is very useful in dealing with these integrals. That's where the analytic number theory comes in. Anyway. Once we, have, once we have the integral in this form, since g hat, since g hat is uh, suitably modular, we can just do the integral by parts. And the boundaries of the fundamental domain cancel out, except around the cusps. And so you get a sum around, uh, over the three cusps of the constant term and a Q expansion of some modular object. The three cusps are the weak coupling domain and the monopole and dion points at tau equals zero, uh, 0 and 2, which correspond to u equals plus and minus lambda squared. And so the integrals around those cusps spoils topological invariance. So we add back in uh, the zyberg witten contributions. That's the sum over infrared spin C structures. has nothing to do with the ultraviolet spin C spin C structures that you need for theories of matter. The infrared spin C structures of the zyberg witten invariant and a trigonometric function of the homology class, which you compute from Z uh, Coulomb. 
Now, what do the other Lagrangian theories compute? Well, the path integral for those localizes um, to an intersection theory on another moduli stack, which is the moduli stack of non-abelian zyberg witten equations, as was pointed out by these gentlemen a long time ago. So instanton moduli space is a very special case. What are the non-abelian zyberg witten equations? Well, referring back to the discussion of general twisting, uh, we have this, this group, which I called G twisted, and we had the constraint, well, we put, it, we put an extra constraint. We ha have a constraint that it's a generalized spin C structure with a generalized spin C connection. And then we take our uh, hypermultiplet representation. Let's, for simplicity, say it's V plus V star. V is a complex representation of G tilde, such that V tensor S plus is a representation of G twisted. Then there's an associated bundle, V, to the, frame bu to the uh, principal bundle, P twisted, and then we can write these uh, famous non-abelian uh, monopole equations. So we're going to be doing intersection theory on that moduli space. But to do that, you need an orientation. And for some reason, nobody seems to have asked themselves how you orient the, the space. So in discussions with Dan Freed and Mike Hopkins, we're, we're seeking to describe the five-dimensional invertible theory whose Hilbert space on a four-manifold is the orientation line of M. And uh, well, so far, the concrete results are just for instanton moduli space. In that case, my, my role has been as chief cheerleader and um, test, a little bit like the uh, role of Edmund Halley in the invention of the, in the publication of the Principia. So, um, so Fried and Hopkins, construct the KO class on the moduli stack of all connections that restricts to the tangent bundle on the instanton moduli stack. That's not hard. I can do that myself. But they also use some rather elaborate topological methods to compute the first and second Stiefel Whitney classes of this KO class. And rather astonishingly, it turns out to be cohomological in terms of WI of X and WI of P which is a big surprise since we're basically calculating mod 2 indices in KO theory. Meanwhile, I was also a pest with uh, Edward Witten, and, um, and uh, th we did a little calculation. I'll tell you some more about it later. And the Freed Hopkins result is consistent with a mod 2 index calculation that we worked out in January. So I'll come back to this point pretty soon. Because now I want to talk about the K-theoretic Donaldson invariance. I'm doing it for time, okay. So, okay. So this is an idea that goes back to uh, work of Nekrasov and, and uh, Losev, Nekrasov and Shadashvili in the late 90s. It's, um, and uh, with these people, I've been studying this, uh, this topic since September 30th, 2021. So, um, so for a little while. That's uh, Jan Manscott, Shenyu Zhang, who is probably in the audience, uh, Runkai Tao, and Hian Kim. So the idea is to start with n equals 1 five-dimensional super Yang mills. So what's our structure group? Our structure group, well, for simplicity, we're going to take gauge group SU2. Uh, the other factors you're familiar with, maybe not the U1 factor. So we have a theory of a vector multiplet. So we have a gauge field. And so we have a current in five dimensions, which is just the trace of F wedge F that's closed. And pointed out by Zyberg long ago. And therefore, since we introduce all background fields, we should introduce a background vector multiplet for this instanton symmetry uh, U1, for this instanton U1 symmetry. That's what I'll call it. So the AI will be a connection on a principal bundle, PI for this uh, principle U1 bundle over X5, uh, whose structure group should be thought of as this U1 instanton symmetry. Now, we have a gauge field. So we have a gauge field, AI, and we have an electric current. So we should make sense to look at the electric coupling of the instanton particle. Or if you prefer to think of it this way, it's a mixed churn simons term. Both points of view are valid. That's an interesting term to look at. 
uh, supersymmetrization of this term turns out to give the entire five-dimensional super Yang Mills action coupled to the background vector multiplet VI. So you start supersymmetrizing that term, and then you get, for example, this standard term in Yang Mills theory where uh, sigma I is the gauge coupling. And just to show you that we're honest, whoops, whoops, whoops. Just to show you that we're honest people, that's the full action. There'll be a quiz on that at the end of the talk. Um, so now you, if you look at this, there's a, a gauge field here. So you might worry, is it globally well-defined? And at first you think yes. And a nice way to see that is to use differential cohomology. So our instanton symmetry U1 bundle PI with its connection defines an element of the second differential cohomology of our five-dimensional space-time. Meanwhile, for the dynamical gauge field, the churn simons invariant defines an element of differential H4. And so we just multiply and integrate in differential cohomology, and we get something in differential H1 of a point, which is R mod Z. And so we get an action when we put it into the exponential. But then, um, well, almost globally well-defined. When the tuft flux of the gauge bundle is not zero, then the instanton particles uh, have fractional charge, so the exponentiated electric coupling can have an anomaly. And again, part of the discussion with Fried and Hopkins is that we are expecting that to be canceled by the anomaly in the fermion determinant for the gauge enos. That's something under, under discussion, but Fried and Hopkins have an absolutely general a formula for all possible fermion determinant anomalies, and so it's just a matter of specializing that formula. So now to get to the k-theoretic Donaldson invariance, we take x5 to be a product of x4 with a circle, and we specialize our instanton symmetry gauge connection in the following way. We say that its holonomy around the circle is independent of x4, we say that PI and FI are pulled back from X4, and under those circumstances, we can define a partial topological twist, again, based on transfer of structure group. And the background, here I was lazy, I um, left off the first and final factors, we're just focusing on these factors, and the background fields, again, are the, just the uh, push forward of the Levitchevity connection. That's topological on X4, but a non-topological spin theory on the S1, indeed the Q-symmetry squares to translation along the S1. So, since it's topological on X4, I can shrink the X4, and I get a, the twisted theory becomes a theory of a super quantum mechanics whose, moduli, whose target space is the moduli stack of instantons, something that was already uh, foreseen by Nikita back in 1996. But again, something that nobody seems to have worried about is that there are potential global anomalies. I just told you that the five-dimensional uh, determinant probably has an anomaly. It's probably not well-defined on A mod G. And a manifestation of that is that the fermion determinant of the superquantum mechanics with instanton moduli space as target is not going to be well-defined on the loop space of the instanton moduli space. That's part of a very general statement pointed out by Witten and Atiyah in 1985 that if you have a super quantum mechanics and the target space is even dimensional but not spin, then the super quantum mechanics is anomalous. Well, so we want to know is the moduli space spin or not. Again, this is all controlled by the same six-dimensional mod two index in KO theory. And as I mentioned before, uh, a little calculation with Edward gave a useful formula for it. So a special case of our result is that if X admits an almost complex structure and our gauge group is PSU 2N, should be, has to be even, uh, then <coughs> M is spin, if and only if the a tough flux dotted the second Stiefel Whitney class of the tangent bundle is zero. Note, by the way, this is a little surprising. It's independent of the instant on number k. And with a little bit of work, you can sit down with Fried and Hopkins, and uh, it turns out to be completely consistent with their more general formula. Okay, well, 
That means that if this is not fulfilled, then our superquantum mechanics is anomalous. But we definitely want to think about the uh, Kate theoretic invariance when this product is not zero. So what do we do? Well, we go to the electric coupling of the instanton particle. And in the case where we x5 is x4 times s1, we reduce on x4, then we get a super quantum mechanics on, on, on the instanton moduli space. Well, the collective coordinate discussion of that term leads to a line bundle with connection, I'll call it Li, over the instanton moduli space. Again, differential cohomology is very useful for understanding why this should be true. So as I said before, the uh, instanton symmetry bundle with connection defines an element of differential H2 of X4. And now if I take the dynamical field on X4 and look at the universal connection for it, that churn simons term for that defines an element of differential H4 of X4 times the space of all connections. And if we multiply and integrate now over X4, well, 2 plus 4 minus 4 is 2. So we get differential H2 of the moduli stack of all connections. Well, differential H2 is a line bundle with connection. So we get a line bundle with connection. But uh, something that I, I found with Hian and uh, Yan and Runkai and, and Xinyu quite some time ago is that this, this uh, electric coupling indeed has a global anomaly sometimes when when the atuft flux of the gauge bundle dotted into the first churn class of the instanton symmetry bundle is not zero. So here's the condition, we think, for, uh, for anomaly cancellation. The atuft flux, oh, that should be a P1. That's a misprint right over there. The atuft flux of the, the gauge bundle dotted into W2 plus Ni should be zero. And in that case, the fermion determinant times the holonomy of this uh, connection on instanton moduli space should be well defined. In fact, I would further conjecture that what we're really doing here is constructing a, um, the quote U1 gauge field of a spin C structure on the moduli space of instantons. So uh, yesterday uh, in Edward's lecture, he showed how many structures on spacetime transfer into analogous structures on instanton moduli space. Interestingly, that's not true for an almost complex structure. But if X4 admits an almost complex structure, then the moduli space is spin C. So that's a very weak piece of evidence for this conjecture. So when the global anomalies cancel, then we have a well-defined partition function. And what's it a function of? As usual, we have these two items. It's also a function of the first turn class of the instanton symmetry bundle and a dimensionless version of the radius of the, of the circle. So this curly R expressed in five dimensional terms has this formula, R to the fourth minus eight pi squared, the radius of the circle over the five dimensional young mill squared plus I theta. So the partition function as a function of R and the first turn class then looks like this. It's a power series in curly R. The powers are the are the dimensions of the instanton moduli space for various components labeled by instanton number k. And the coefficients, the coefficients are the Witten indices for the superquantum mechanics with that component of instanton moduli space, which in good cases will be the L2 index of this Dirac operator coupled to this spin C connection. So, because we've got an index and not just intersection theory, that's, I think, why Nekrasov, Losev, and Shadashvili called these the K-theoretic Donaldson invariants. OK, so um, these, uh, these were studied by mathematicians, Gucha, Nakajima, and Yoshioka, Yoshioka. And what we add is we study this using both the Coulomb branch integral and for a toric Kähler manifold um, toric localization. So the story looks very similar to what we found in four dimensions. And because time is running short, I'm going to go very fast through this. So you have a Coulomb branch plus a Seiberg witten term. Uh, the Coulomb branch is based on the Coulomb branch integral. What's the Coulomb branch? 
Well, again, for SU2 gauge theory or SO3, it's parametrized now by the supersymmetric Wilson line. And importantly, there's a one-form symmetry that flips the sign of the supersymmetric Wilson line. And now the Coulomb branch turns out to be a branch double cover of the modular curve for gamma naught four. Here's the formula for the branching. So here we have the fundamental domain for gamma naught four, similar to what you find in uh, SU2 with fundamental flavors. There's a branching, so there's one branch point in there. Now if you look at the, um, if you look at the formula for the double cover, uh, the, the uh, one form symmetry is also the deck transformation of the double cover. And now if you look at the Coulomb branch integral and compute the way the measure changes under the deck transformation, it's exactly the same phase that we saw for anomaly cancellation. And so interestingly, the Coulomb branch integral is zero when there's a global anomaly, which leads to a lot of interesting conceptual issues, but I'll skip over that. I want to skip over the detailed form of the Coulomb branch integral. But once again, it's the integral of something holomorphic times a total derivative. It could be hard to find that total derivative. For that, you need mock modular forms. But you can find it. And so now it looks like exactly like what we had in four dimensions. You just do the, the contour integral, and you get the constant term around the various cusps. And if you do that, you get the wrong answer. It disagrees with Gucha, Nakajima, and Yoshioka. So something funny, I think we've been confused about this for two years, but now I know the answer. Okay, so here's the answer. So, so the, the point is that there's a subtle order of limits here. We can take the, the radius of the circle to zero or we can take the weak coupling limit. So the, the Haupt module blows up in the weak coupling limit. Here's the formula for the double cover. Now just look at that formula. You can do this in your own head right now. If we take curly R goes to zero, then obviously U goes to plus or minus two. But if we take R fixed and take M tau goes to infinity, U goes to infinity. So the picture as R goes to zero is that we have scaling regions around U equals plus or minus two. They're related by the uh, double cover or the one form symmetry, which look like four dimensional physics. And in the modular domain, it's the region under the branch point. The position of the branch point goes like I log 1 over R. So what we should do is we should do the integration by parts, get the sum over the cusps where we take the constant term, but in here we should first expand in R and then take the constant term in the Q expansion. So if you take the Q expansion at finite R, you get the wrong answer. If you expand in R and take the Q expansion, you get amazing agreement with Gocha, Nakajima, and Yoshioka. Okay, so I'm pretty short on time, so um, let me say quickly that all of this should generalize to six dimensions, but it hasn't been done. So I want to go to the end uh, section. So that's another generalization of, these, uh, of the Donaldson-Witten paradigm, and those are the family Donaldson invariants. So this is an Interesting generalization uh, to families of four manifolds, which was mentioned by Donaldson a long time ago. A modest amount of work has been done on it in the math literature, but nothing in the physics literature until I started working with uh, uh, Jay uh, Cushing, Vivek Saxena, who you've already met, who needs a job, and Martin Rocek, whom you all know. So we have families of metrics. So we consider, we're going to consider the twisted uh, theory for a family of metrics parametrized by some S, S is in some parameter space. Now, as we already know, the Donaldson-Witten function as a function of the metric is independent of the parameter. But when you couple to supergravity, you get not a function, but you get a whole inhomogeneous differential form on parameter space. And it's a closed differential form. So you get something like uh, this. And now if you integrate that over closed cycles in your, in your family, you could get something interesting. Those are the family Donaldson invariants. Interestingly, as far as we can see, there's no restriction on B2 plus and no assumption of almost complex structure. Whether that's significant or not, I do not know. So, so once you're talking about families, 
Uh, you might as well talk about the universal family, the space of all metrics mod diffeomorphisms. And that's a topologically interesting space because after all, the diffeomorphism group has interesting topology. For example, uh, the four-dimensional mapping class group can very well be uh, non-trivial, and that corresponds to pi one of met mod diff. Now, I remind you of what uh, Balya and Singer taught us about Donaldson and Witten theory. If we have a principal gauge bundle over X, then we can look at the G, G equivariant cohomology of the space of all connections, where curly G is the group of all gauge transformations. And then these equations, which I flashed before, are just the equations for the Carton model differential of, of equivariant cohomology. And so from this point of view, Z, Donaldson, Witten is just the push forward in G equivariant cohomology. Now if we, now let's introduce the, the group of uh, oriented diffeomorphisms of X, and we can write again the G equivariant cohomology of the space of metrics. And in physics notation, it looks like this. So it's very simple. And a very interesting and non-trivial thing is that these equations, exactly these equations, arise from a truncated and twisted n equals two superconformal gravity. That a lot of work went into that statement. The phi upper mu is a ghost field. Then the action, the exponentiated action, is a closed equivariant uh, class in the G semi-direct GD equivariant cohomology of metrics times gauge connections. So we push forward in G equivariant cohomology, and at least formally, we should get a GD equivariant class on the space of metrics. And uh, heroic calculations by J and Vivek gave us a derive explicit actions by coupling to truncated and twisted n equals two conformal supergravity. So the end result, after a lot of processing, is very simple. simple. Let's just focus on the first term in the gravitino. It couples to the lambda mu nu, whose Q gives us the energy momentum tensor. And there are a lot of formulas for the other terms. So the very simplest example, what's the very simplest example of a family Donaldson invariant? Well, you take an element of the four-dimensional mapping class group. It corresponds to a non-trivial cycle in met mod diff. And so we integrate over that cycle, and so that translates into this expression here. We should just integrate this. But this expression is very funny because Q on lambda mu nu is the energy momentum tensor. So um, lambda mu nu is not Q closed, so it's not at all clear that our period integral localizes to the moduli space of instantons. So that's both a, um, that's both a bug and a feature. It's a challenge and um, an opportunity. Uh, it, it's an opportunity because maybe we'll see something that we don't see about topology of four manifolds it just from instanton moduli space, but from this wider point of view. But it's also a big challenge because how in the world are you going to go about evaluating this thing? Well, the only idea I have about that is that an important aspect of the derivation that Witten and I gave of the Donaldson-Witten partition function used a theorem about tree-level exactness of the low energy effective theory. And uh, uh, an open question is whether that persists in this family case. So I, how am I doing for time? Out of time, probably? Oh, really? really? Amazing. Okay. Um, okay. So I probably went too fast. So, um, so questions and, and future directions. So what I, I talked about the topological data for twisting the general D equals four N equals two theory. Uh, we answered that for the Lagrangian theories. We conjecture it for the general case. Uh, what's the or invertible theory governing the orientation of non-abelian Zyberg-Witten moduli space that's under study uh, with Fried and Hopkins? Uh, uh, related to that are the global anomalies of five-dimensional super Yang mills I talked about. I didn't uh, indicate this, but I don't have much to say about it, but there clearly should be a generalization to elliptic invariance from K-theoretic to elliptic invariance from 60 theories on a four manifold times an elliptic curve. And there are puzzles concerning the generalization to uh, uh, family Donaldson invariance. And there are other puzzles and directions I haven't had time to mention. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Greg.
Thank you very much for the great talk. So uh, first I wanted to remind you something and then make a suggestion. So this global anomaly of five-dimensional theory, which is W2 times W2, was actually derived in a paper called Ava Four-Dimensional Avatars. Of oh four my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the an analog of the shift K goes to K plus uh, N of Chen Simon's theory lifted to the... Uh, for, uh, for, for an formation. arbitrary format? Yes, yes. Okay, so, we got to talk so, about that. So, and so the dual cost number because, becomes first chain class. And mod 2 is W2. And well, I had certainly forgotten about that. Okay. That, now, the uh, non-trivial classes in, in uh, BDIF, which you need to, to -diff, probe yeah. your, pro yeah. probe your yeah. uh, family invariants. So one, and that was suggested in the paper called Issues. In <laughs> Sorry? In the paper called Issues in, for, in, for, in Topological Field Theory. So you can get them by taking the form manifold to be a product of a ribbon surface times another ribbon surface. And then Donaldson theory almost reduces to the gram witten theory of with source being one curve uh, and the target being module space of flat connections on another one. So promote that to topological string. So the A model on the module space of flat connections. So now uh, take the true gram witten invariants. So those are uh, gravitational invariants, uh, which you're looking so for. Let me see if I understand. That, that applies when the four manifold is a product or a bundle of surface over surface? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, so your, the cycles would be the cycles so in MGN. Specializing the four manifold, you have that. That would be, yeah. that would be fascinating. And then you can compare maybe by some yeah. kind of wall crossing reduce many. many so you, at least you produce lots of cycles that way. So yeah, that's a great suggestion. So at least in that case, perhaps one could evaluate. And finally, the, 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 about the tree-level exactness. So for, for this gravitational, gravitationally dressed non and variance, you actually need the epsilon 1, epsilon 2 corrections to the effective action. You need because the what? So you, in, in the end, you mentioned that whether the effective action is, is exact at yeah. level. So you need gravitational corrections, oh, yeah. which, are, which oh, yeah. are given by epsilon 1, epsilon 2. So yeah, absolutely. Are, it's the zero-th order term in the expansion of your function. Yeah, we need, you need not zero. We've, no, we've what I'm saying that, that very carefully. For, for this family invariance, you need all terms, not not just zero thought of terms. So that it's analogous to the to given that J function in two dimensions. So it it, can, it it knows about descendant classes. Oh, I hope you're wrong about that because that's going to be hard. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think we saw that. I mean, I should say that the main work in that section was starting with conformal supergravity, which is truly scary. Um, you know, it would take me an hour just to show you the whole Lagrangian. And, uh, and, and, and then getting to this very, very simple, I mean, this, this was really, uh, let's see. Yeah, where's it going? How come it's not going back? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, that looks pretty simple. But uh, getting there from conformal supergravity, that was the point of our paper. But, uh, yeah. All right, so maybe you... My colleagues, so I, I, I heard, I heard the, 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 your sufferings. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, so, a lot. That's right, they were at Stony Brook, right? <laughs> uh, Craig, when you discuss the five-dimensional case, yeah. do you consider it important to start with an ultraviolet completion? Well, we don't have a Lagrangian for that, so... What, what do you mean? The five-dimensional theory has an ultraviolet... Uh, it has an ultraviolet completion, and I think that's important. Oh, which one do you have? Which like, e1, completion do you have in the mind? The E1 theory of Zyberg? Doesn't it have a tensor multiplet at low energies? No, I don't think so. I think it's just 5D super young mills. I hope I'm not wrong. Well, the reason I suspect you're not right is that the E1 theory is conformally invariant in five dimensions, right? Yes. And... The Yang-Mills theory has a gauge coupling constant, which I think is the expectation value of a scalar in, the t in a tensor multiplet. So I think the E1 theory at low energies has what you're talking about plus a tensor multiplet. Gauge coupling is a what? The gauge coupling, no, 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 that's not right. Um, so uh, in fact, yeah. Well, the gauge coupling certainly um, violates conformal invariance. So if it comes from a conformally invariant theory, it's the expectation value of a field. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. I, I actually flashed it. But it comes from a vector multiplet. Oh, well, sorry. In five dimensions, a tensor multiplet is dual to a vector multiplet. That's true. So you can say it that way. <laughs> yeah, okay, there we are. That's you, the resolution. You can say it that way. Yeah. But it, right, but it, right, 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 right. But right, right. the multiplet in question isn't in SU2. 
No, it's the U1. It's, it's the U1. Okay, I'm trying to get back <laughs> to where I flash this. Uh, It's, a ve it's, the, it's the vector multiplet for the U1 instanton symmetry. God. Oh, so it's really a U2 theory then? Well, Two it's not theory? dynamic. That U, that v, that's the, you're, I think we're talking about VI here. See, the, here's, here's the gauge coupling. It's uh, the expectation value of the scalar in a, in a vector multiplet uh, for U1. Okay, but it, when you claim there's an ultraviolet completion, that vector field is dynamical. You can't freeze it and also say that there's an ultraviolet completion. Um, that doesn't sound good. Um, That would amount to an integral over R. Uh, I, I don't like that. Um, yeah, it's, I, well, but Edward's saying it can't be non-dynamical. It has to be dynamical. Well, I'm, I'm saying not sure it's not. That. I'm saying it's dynamical if you actually want to claim there's a UV completion. That's why I started by asking if you thought the UV completion is important for what you're doing. Well, I, I, I like to do work with things where there's a UV completion, so I believe that I'm talking about something that makes sense in the UV. Um, I can define, you know, I can proceed with the Yang-Mills theory with a cutoff, I suppose, and uh, think that it's, it, it's not gonna matter with the topological twist. I mean, the formula, you know, the, the generating function for the Witten indices makes make sense, and the calculations also make sense of, the, uh, of these Witten indices. So I would be pretty surprised if this, there's some fundamental problem here. You can geometrically engineer this theory by taking type so 2A on, on the local collabial. Then the dynamical gauge field would correspond to normalizable uh, uh, two forms on this collabial, and the non-dynamical -dynam one, which is responsible for the coupling will correspond to non-normalizable mode. So they, they should be frozen. Well, in, in, in yeah, the... I like that. Um, Sorry, it's I, not I have to uh, reconcile that with what Edward's saying. Um, yeah. Um, can, you, can you repeat that, uh, Nikita? So we start with M-theory on, on local collabial. For example, local P1 cross P1. So P1 cross P1 has two cycles, but in the, in the th collabial geometry, uh, the normalizable uh, two forms, uh, 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 second, uh, the L2 uh, second cohomology is one dimensional. And so that corresponds to a dynamical gauge field in five dimensions. The other uh, H2 corresponds to non-dynamical gauge field, which is the uh, coupling. And so that models SU2 theory uh, long to different. And maybe in the same vein, it's it's the the UV completion is the SU two zero cyber th theory, no? And that's engineered by the geometry that Nikita was just talking about. And there's actually a related question. If you're looking at the UV complete theory, the flavor symmetry changes, right? As this enhancement, so then your structure group that you should start with is actually different from I think the one that you're looking at. Well, yeah. Okay. So um, let's see. I mean, one, one thing I should say is that I think it's important, as I was stressing, that we should be looking at these theories as series in R around R equals zero, which I think is related to this. And indeed, and indeed, we're going to get to it. Skipped over this, but I think it's relevant to this discussion. Explicit results, blah, blah, blah. Explicit results, blah, blah, blah. So indeed, um, I, we're expanding in uh, this R to the fourth. And um, D5, uh, if, if the, at infinite coupling, we get the E1 theory. 
and indeed, we're finding that all sorts of funny things are true at r to the fourth equals one, which I think is related to uh, what Sakura and Edward and, uh, and Nikita are saying. And I can I add one other thing? So it's not just that the flavor symmetry changes, but the flavor symmetry is now not independent from the one-form symmetry. So actually, the UV-complete theory has a two-group symmetry, which is okay. broken on the Coulomb branch. Yeah. You won't see it on the it's Coulomb gonna be, It's going to be hard to see it from this point of view. So, um, and it's going to be hard to formulate those topological invariants because they're not Lagrangian. So, I mean, that's... that's I do what I know how to do. I can work with the Lagrangians. So I, I need to think about this point. I don't have a good answer. <coughs> All right, is there any other question? Vivek? I guess for mathematicians, it's been very helpful that the cyber wooden invariants can be reformulated in terms of uh, sigma model into symmetric power of surface. What is the analogous, do you know what the analogous statement is for your uh, more jet, this non-abelian cyber Witten and so on? I thought you were going to say it's, it's been helpful to have a formulation in terms of Grum of Witten. But um, uh, no, I do not know the analog. Um, I don't think Gucha Nakajima and Yoshoka know either. Uh, they were using Mochizuki and stuff like that. So no, I don't know the answer to that. All right, no more. Okay, thank you, Greg. Okay. Thirty. Okay, so we'll be back.